finally, after much waiting for another console release after Metal Gear Solid 4, we have Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Revenge. Revengeance. Is that even a real world? Who cares? It's about Cyborg Ninja's swordplay giant mechs and it's set in the world of Metal, Metal Gear. In the year 2018, 40 years after the events of Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots, we assume the role of Mr. Thunderbolt. Lame. Or more likely known as Raiden. No, not that one. That one. Raiden has since joined a private military company known as the Maverick Corp, where he is placed as security detail for African Prime Minister Namani. Someone's blocking the lead vehicle. Hold on. Clear the road! This is official state business! However, even with a cyborg ninja and a fair amount of armed guards, shit has hits the fan and holy shit, is that a Metal Gear? Did I kill you in two? And then again in four? Seriously? How the fuck are you back? Anyway, Prime Master's taken captive by Sundowner, a rival PMC cyborg and a bit of an asshole in my opinion. Before Raiden can pursue him, we're confronted by Metal Gear Ray, or at least a replica of it. Back in my day, Metal Gears weren't so goddamn common. Shut up, Whistler! This fight is freaking awesome. We're in the first level of the game and already given so much eye candy and MGS fangasms to last till Metal Gear Solid 5. Well, maybe. Seriously, hurry up, fuck up, Kojima. Hurry, please. The fight is quite the spectacle if you know what you're doing, but I'll get into gameplay and combat later on. Okay, tight, so time to land the final. Holy! But hey, with that out of the way... That damn you cheat! It still works? Hey, are you fucking kidding me? Alright, so determined not to give it a rest, Ray is back for round 2. Now logically I complain about the fact we're already having a boss rematch this early, but fuck it, it's Metal Gear Race, so the fact that doesn't is not going Oh my god... Awesome! Admittedly, all my skepticism is kicking in, and I'm waiting to find out the rest of the game is crap or it's just a tech demo or something. I can't use Square Enix. Half of what John Lennon was trying to say. Oh shit! Well, GG. Guess Ryden isn't getting that paycheck.
enemies, but you hold it back. No. My sword is a tool of justice. Now personally, I like the set up here. In a subtle manner, we're quickly reminded how powerful Raiden has become since Metal Gear Solid 4. And we end the level on a note that we're confronted with a far stronger force in the form of Jetstream Sam. Seriously, who names these guys? Sam is quickly presented as a rival to Raiden, given a similar look who is also a cyborg warrior with an impressive feat of swordsmanship and skill. In turn, staging Raiden as the underdog while giving the player a clear obstacle to overcome and adding an overall character art for Raiden as we see him getting stronger as we progress. So with that being set up, we can fairly dive into the gameplay and now personally, I'm very conflicted with the gameplay and mechanics overall. You see, Metal Gear Rising just never seems to be quite certain on what kind of experience it's trying to sell to the player. Considering Metal Gear Solid's tagline was tactical espionage action, so Metal Gear Solid games were always primarily about sneaking with a light to medium amount of action depending on what game. Metal Gear Rising's tagline being lightning bolt action, with emphasis on swordplay, hack and slash mechanics, but also including what feels like a somewhat forced stealth element. You see, at first it feels like Rising's developers were very reluctant to step away from their formula, which is being expected when you take a popular game franchise and attempt something completely different. Though for at least the 50% of the first few missions, and somewhere towards the end, you can in a way stealth the game, stealth being used as a more of an ambush technique but it does allow for some interesting gameplay styles, which is really fun. And with improvement, it could have been integrated more smoothly with other mechanics rather than feeling like squeezed in as an optional idea. Seeing this is effectively a hack and slash game, there is of course a list of combos to unleash on your unsuspecting victims. Or you can use blade mode and hope to god to walk into you like some sort of automated chase list. Combat and combo moves can take a bit of getting used to, with a rather unorthodox system which, it can be argued, makes the game rather inaccessible to newcomers to the hack and slash genre and to game casual gamers alike. However, much to its rather steep learning curve and an odd controller layout, I praise Ryzen's take on hack and slash, I'm in love with this game's more hardcore take on fighting, as unlike others in the genre, it doesn't feel like you can just mash away at the buttons or use the same dominant fighting strategies to win every encounter, especially with a variety of enemies requiring very different tactics thus complementing player creativity and varying gameplay styles. At first, I was really annoyed with the parry system and the lack of a clear dodge move, but once I learned the parry system and the method of dodging, it's actually really fun. Both complement combat as they actually work more like combos themselves, so they blend in with the fighting. Now as much as these guys are aggravating as hell, one mechanic alone makes up for them. The latest awesomeness brought to you from Kojima Productions in line with Platinum Games is Blade Mode. Blade Mode allows the player to slow down time effectively going into a bullet time where you can either quickly slash your enemies to pieces or precisely target foes specific weak points. Most hack and slash games, you really feel like you're using a blade as you slice through your enemies' arms, legs, weapons, turrets, even shields. And along with blade mode is an Datsun mode, where you take the spines of your foes and convert them into energy, which is freaking brutal. Why don't I give you a demonstration? I think it's time for Jack to let her rip. 
Blade Mode's true shine comes into effect when it comes to the bosses. But Whistler, surely the boss fights can't all be as epic as Metal Gear Ray. Shut the f- With roughly 8 bosses in total, I was surprised too when it came to the amount of work put into each of these bosses. Especially considering when I heard that apparently all the bosses were finished roughly around the same time the game was actually going to be cancelled. Now they don't have the same amount of backstory and imprint as Metal Gear Solid bosses like Psycho Mantis. Still don't believe me? Now I'll read more deeply into your soul. No saved games. Your memory is completely clean. You have saved often. You are a prudent person. They are still unique and interesting however, especially with their fights. Seriously, this and other fights were really engaging, fast paced and even after redoing these were still a blast. Each boss fight has you dodging missiles or relentless attacks, involving figuring out each boss's unique strategy, each requiring you to hone your skills, especially with the blade mode. Each of these is freaking awesome set pieces high speed blockbuster action that really requires you to f you work out your enemy's weakness as you really feel like you're a cyborg ninja going up against these giant mechs and super powered cyborg warriors. Now, as much as it can be argued this isn't important, but with this it comes one of the best soundtracks I've heard in a while. Each is absolutely heart racing and improves the overall feel of each fight tenfold. I've listened to this track at least, um, you know, five, uh, oh, look at the time! Time to listen to the boss fight tracks again! Now, the story is a bit lacking overall, especially considering Metal Gear Rising's playtime. The clock's only in at roughly 6 hours max in length. We eventually learn that the Desperado Corp is involved in her harvesting children's brains. Yeah, 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 you heard me right. Harvesting children's, children's brains. brains. Now, this is significant to those who are M Metal Gear savvy. As Metal Gear games have always had a very fairly strong message and themes within them about child soldiers and anti-war and the Cold War. And the child soldier angle is very specific to Ride, being a child soldier himself, and there's even the morality issue somewhat brought up throughout about war economy, private military corps, and even about the um, if it is right to kill a cyborg. And even Sam confronts Raiden about his rampage as he rots through on his way to the Desperado HQ. My sword is a means to an end, to protect those you'd prey on. Really? Let me ask you, all those cyborgs you've killed up to now, maybe they weren't kids, but they were people. You ever think about them? Sure they're adults. Sure they signed up for this. Right on the dotted line of their BMC contract. Usually they're no strangers to war. 
Open your eye and see, Raiden. I've seen plenty. Please, God, don't let me die. Let's do this! This isn't fair. I didn't know what I was signing up for. Okay, so never mind, a cutscene later we're back to slicing foes, so it, it doesn't matter for those who don't like plot lines getting too serious. This did annoy me as the game's story never seems to be sure of what what story it's trying to tell. Sadly, character development also suffers, as we are very quickly introduced to a rather large scale of main characters from both sides. Yet Ryzen's team are practically non-existent or just feel stapled on to follow the formula from previous titles. Then each of the bosses, they seem really cool and really interesting, yet they lack a lot of backstory in my opinion, especially with Sam, Whereas I previously mentioned, clearly he's set up as Ry uh, Raiden's rival, but there just doesn't seem to be enough build up than there should be. I reckon he should have confronted Raiden more than often, so when we finally confront him, there would be far more of an emotional and epic payoff. However, the rematch between these two is still very well done. It was awesome nonetheless, even if the true conflict of these two heroes who respect each other as warriors are on, that are on the opposing side wasn't fully realised. And it ends here. Okay. Let's dance! Even Raiden doesn't get much development after he goes Super Cyborg version 2. He shows he has a strong sense of justice, but suddenly in the fight with one of the bosses, he just switches to this rage-fueled, bloodlusting killing machine, and this never seems to be an issue or even taken anywhere, which just makes me feel like the writers weren't really sure how to develop on his fairly solid character that was already established for Metal Gear Solid 2 and 4. However, this only got on my nerves towards the end, as we were confronted by... Okay, so if you're actually planning on playing this game and you actually care about the story, I'm about to reveal like the final boss, so you might want to just click here and avoid that and deal. You've been warned. So we're greeted by this game's Metal Gear. Now, as much as I am annoyed that there isn't nearly enough build up for this Metal Gear considering how it's done in previous Metal Gear games, this fight is still brutal and definitely great overall, however, once we defeat it, we are greeted with this game's main antagonist. Don't fuck with me, Senator. What? Force of will, following your own set of rules. With your own two hands, you took back your life. This fight switches from serious to silly at the drop of a hat. I mean, the fight is awesome, it's fun, 
It's a little frustrating, but definitely challenging, and it's definitely a final boss battle worthy. However, these fights are interrupted by what personally feels like a dried out discussion about politics. And as much as I love this, it just feels like it's shoved in at the last second. So usually the political themes are kept to a minimum, or are, you know, they're balanced out throughout the game. However, in Metal Gear Rising, it's just kind of forced on you at the last second, it just feels really out of place. And sadly, with the boss fight over, it kind of feels like they just ran out of time, as there doesn't seem to be enough of an overall impact and payoff for what should have happened. But it just seems to fall into the same category as other modern games these days, it just seems to suffer from crap ending syndrome. And sadly, Metal Gear Rising is lacking in length, being roughly 4-6 to six hours for a normal playthrough. However, considering there's multiple difficulties, several collectibles, and the game is just short and sweet, so it holds enough replayability to satisfy the Metal Gear itch that, at least until sequel or Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain comes out, seriously Kojima, bring it out already! It's fucking torturing me here! I said my sword was a tool of justice. Not used in anger. Not used for vengeance. But now, now I'm not so sure. And besides, this isn't my sword. Okay. Let's dance. Now considering the crisp animation, awesome swordplay, badass boss fights, rewarding and challenging gameplay, top of a kick-ass soundtrack and amazing action-packed visuals, Metal Gear Rising easily cuts its way to an 8 out of 10 for me. And considering confirmed DLC with Jetstream Sam and others on the way, I would easily give this a 9 out of 10 if it helps flesh out some more of the characters and backstory that it needed. And Metal Gear Rising definitely deserves a sequel. With lot of improvements, like improvements on the storyline, so we have a much more emphasis on character development and plot, I could see a sequel having so much potential. Or I'm gonna have to wait for Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain. Still not really over that, Kojima. Be nice if you are. I had it. Now! Yes, yes, I'm aware this review is incredibly late. I am aware of this. But hey, if you enjoyed the video, be sure you leave a like, a comment, maybe subscribe. But hey, you should